Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And welcome again, folks, to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and we're, no, we're not back in our studio inside Renaissance Bank in Alpharetta, there on Windward Parkway uh, quite yet, but we look forward to that day uh, sometime soon. In the meantime, if you need more personal ex- uh, and a more personal experience with your bank, if you're tired of a 1-800 number or you're tired of not being able to get a live person, um, even when you call a local number, uh, well, call Renaissance Bank. Go to renaissancebank.com, find your local office, some 200 of them around the South ready to serve you, and um, they'll answer the phone, and they'll welcome you in their office. Now, you have to make an appointment ahead of time because the branches are still closed to walk-ins, but if you make an appointment, they'll be glad to see you and uh, help you out. And we know firsthand from the great work they've done, some of the folks that we have worked with. So uh, check them out, Renaissance Bank. Dot com is the website again. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. And now I want to welcome Bob Tanksley. Bob's a old friend from Neary Capital, part, Neary Capital Partners. Bob, welcome. Hey, hey, John. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, so, for those that don't know you and Neary Capital Partners, why don't you give an overview of how you're helping folks out there? Sure. So we're a boutique investment bank. I know that's a mouthful, but basically uh, we help owners unlock the value in their companies when it's re- when it's time to sell. Uh, probably 90, 95 percent of our work is on the sell side. We do represent buyers uh, on occasion. It might be a, a private equity firm. It might be uh, another larger corporation looking to make an acquisition. So sometimes we get involved in what we call the buy side. And then thirdly, uh, we do uh, business valuation estimates. There's a lot of interest in uh, among owners in understanding the value of what they have. So uh, we provide that uh, as a what ends up being a very much needed service. So, I mean, let's get right into it because we, we're here in the middle of a pandemic and lots of things have changed. Most certainly the environment for buying and selling businesses, uh, why don't you describe what's what you see out there, what's going on in, in the market? Yeah, so the the small business market is uh, has been hit hard. You know, it, it's no big secret. Been making lots of headlines lately. Uh, I think during traumatic recessions like we're going through right now, uh, small businesses tend to be hit uh, quite a bit harder than, than large ones. They're just not as well capitalized. They don't have as much cash resources and whatnot. So uh, we're seeing that reflected in the deal market as well. Unfortunately, some of our seller clients are uh, still thinking about the way business used to be. They're, they're still under the belief that you know their companies are, are worth as much, maybe not completely as much, but uh, close to it uh, that they used to be. Maybe they haven't been presented with enough uh, offers yet to reset their expectations. On the other side of the coin, uh, we've got buyers that are still uh, very much uh, on on hold, not wanting to uh, to pick up pennies in front of a steamroller, as they say. Mm. You know, they they don't want to buy a business for thirty cents on the dollar and come in that that opportunity, if you will, comes with thirty cents on the dollar problems. So not a lot of deals getting done. Uh, I talk with my my colleagues, my peers in the industry, and uh, I'm seeing the same trend um, no matter who I talk to. And that is for every three deals that were happening uh, before COVID uh, started, one of those deals is never going to come back. That, bes- that business model has just imploded. It might have been a, a restaurant deal. It might have been um, you know a company that arranges travel or one, uh, you know, maybe a hotel. Uh, or, or retail. Retail has been hit very heavily. So that deal is 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 likely not coming back. You know, we're seeing the stats now of so many businesses uh, in that space be shut down. 
Uh, we're also seeing deals that are put on hold. They might have been, you know, far enough along in the negotiations. The buyer really wants the the business, and so those deals are progressing, but um, you know, at a at a much slower pace. And then thirdly, you know, there are some bright spots out there that that deals uh, deals are getting done, um, but uh, but they're just going to be put on hold, and who knows when. Uh, who knows when those deals are going to be coming back. So that's kind of the state of the union right now. Um, yeah. So lots to unpack there, but I want to um, kind of zero back to you for a second. So we were talking before we came on the air about kind of what your sweet spot is in terms of the, the, the types of clients that you work with. And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about that specific um part of the market. Yeah, um, you can you can kind of broadly segment the the small business spectrum um, into into three distinct segments. And one would be uh, you know, call it the main street business model. It's a smaller company, it, it might be grossing two to three million uh, annually in revenue. And then you might have um, you know, a much larger bracket, the company might be grossing 100 million, 200 million, somewhere in between, uh, and, and definitions vary, but let's call it uh, 5 million on the low end, 100 million on the high end. Uh, that defines what we call the middle market. And our space as a firm is in the lower end of that middle market. So uh, we, we find a lot of opportunity and we find that we work real well in that space where companies are grossing maybe four to 5 million per year. Uh, 40, 50 million per year on the high end. Lots of opportunities in that space. Uh, in terms of business models that we like to serve, uh, we, if, uh, if, if I were to have an opportunity back in an industrial park or a business park somewhere, uh, that, that would uh, that'd be probably a deal that I'd be very interested in. So that's, you know, logistics, manufacturing, chemical, industrial, uh, value added distribution, wholesaling, e-commerce. I love e-commerce, which has become uh, very popular uh, as a business model these days. You know, just good solid companies delivering products and services to other businesses for the most part. Sure, sure. So you describe the the environment generally. Uh, how, how does it impact? Are there any, I guess, specific differences that impact that lower middle market that you serve, or is it pretty much the same across the board? Yeah. Um, I, I rarely like to use a broad brush to paint something, but mm-hmm. um, in this case you really can. And that is that uh, uh, multiples you know, owners like to talk about the multiples They hear, you know, multiples all the time. Uh, the multiples almost across the board, John, have come down. Um, so something that might've sold for, four or five times uh, what's called adjusted EBITDA before the crisis, you know, might've shaved off uh, a full, a full one times or maybe one and a half times that adjusted EBITDA. So these are some, some true significant uh, reductions in value. And the data, the data is, is starting to come in. We saw in Q3 and Q4 of last year where the multiples on, on lower mid market companies started to tick down just slightly each quarter uh, when the first quarter was done, it was it was uh, a severe impact, and now the data on the second quarter is coming in, and uh, it's just a big crater. It's uh, it's a different world out there entirely. When that's going to turn around is anybody's guess, but you know there are some some bright stars out there, some business models that are going to shine during this. Yeah, and and it takes a while for business owners uh mindset to adjust right i mean uh the pandemic came on much quicker than that mindset adjust and nobody thinks their baby is ugly uh when it comes to thinking about their own business right so how, how do you have that conversation with a business owner pause for dramatic effect uh, <laughs> yeah that that is that is an excellent question Um, and it's, it's one that we spend a lot more time trying to answer when we talk with a new business owner client, Mm. you know, we used to place an emphasis on resetting the expectations of what true transferable value looks like. Now we spend an extraordinary amount of time around that idea. 
<clears throat> that is, if, if we go to market, if, if we as a firm try to do our thing and build a marketing package and create a buyer pool and truly understand the company to the point where the owner could step away and we could tell their story to any buyer, if we're going to go through that 70, 80, 100 hour exercise, and what we're going to come back with is just low buyer offer after low buyer offer after low buyer offer. We want to prep the owner for that as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. For us, that that's one of the first two or three conversations after hi, how are you? I'm Bob. But, you know, of course, uh, we, we want to want to let the owner know in a very realistic sense what they're going to be facing. You know, owners should keep in mind at all times good economic times, bad economic times, buyers just don't like to pay retail. They don't like to pay the full asking price. <clears throat> and um, they rarely like to pay you know, premium over and above what a fair valuation might suggest. But now you throw on uh, a crisis uh, situation that we're in now and the offers we're seeing are you know, 20, 30, 40% lower uh, than, than we might've gotten before. So we want owners to understand that ahead of time, have that conversation as early as possible. We call it resetting the expectations. It might lose us some opportunities to represent them, but I'd rather have that conversation and let an owner honestly know up front than to get, you know, a hundred hours deep into a project and, and he's really disappointed. We want to, we want to try to prevent that. Folks, we're speaking with Bob Tanksley and Bob is uh, a principal with uh, Neary Capital Partners. Bob, let's, Talk a little bit about business valuations because this this subject feeds into what you've been talking about. Um, I guess first of all, what you know, define it may seem self evident, but what is a business evalu valuation? Why does it matter that business owners ought to pay attention to getting one or uh, keeping one updated before the sale process starts? Yeah. Yeah, great question, especially nowadays. So business value is quite simply, it's it's an objective assessment of what a business might trade for, might sell for if taken to market, taking into account a lot of different factors. First and foremost is the financial history of the company itself. So we're looking at profit and loss statements, sometimes referred to as income statements. We're looking at balance sheets. We're looking at tax returns. Yes, tax returns, because sometimes there's little gems or things in the tax return that uh, that don't necessarily show up in the financial statements. And believe me, John, I've seen everything. <laughs> I've seen the boat. I've seen the plane, the multiple cars, the vacation home, the kids college. Lots of stuff gets run through uh, uh, a private business. No, no judgments here. Do, you know, sure. do what you want on a tax return. But um, we want to present it. You know, we, we want to enter the data in into a tool and use, you know, some experience uh, and, and look at the business objectively. So we have to remove the effect of of all of those uh, what might be called personal expenses or perks. Uh, we also want to remove the effect of interest. Uh, most forms of interest, we want to add back depreciation. So there's a number of, of variables that factor into this. We also want to be aware of some of the subjective things that uh, that influence valuation that might not necessarily be found on financial statements. Things like top line growth, that's our gross revenue growth. Things like our uh, our EBITDA margin, our bottom line, what's left over. And for those in your audience that haven't heard that term yet, EBITDA or adjusted EBITDA is, is a rough approximation of cash flow. Uh, we also want to consider subjective factors like the Recurrence of revenue. So the owner wakes up January 1st of each year. How much revenue can they you know, realistically uh, expect to keep coming in the rest of the year? Uh, we also want to look at customer concentration or client concentration. So how much of the revenue is concentrated in among a small group of clients? And then finally, we ask, you know, the, the most subjective question of all, and that is what happens to the business if something happens to the owner? I find that to be the most concerning question that buyers have deal after deal. The buyer is thinking, I step into the owner's shoes. I start you know, trying to do what they do. I try, start trying to know what they know and, and quickly develop all these relationships. What happens to this cash flow profile when that owner is gone after a reasonable transition time, of course, 
uh, how much of the revenue, how much of the cash flow is going to stop. And they're always thinking worst case scenario. You know, you got to, you got to, you got to think like a buyer. And if I, if I leave anything ultra important with your listeners here, and that is if an owner is considering being a seller, they need to start thinking like a buyer. That to me is probably the most difficult mind shift that, that an owner, um, uh, that an owner needs to make as they approach some form of exit or transition. So there you have it, financial statements, subjective data, and then we want to look at market comparables in the business. And all these things basically comprise uh, business valuation. And what you're describing, Bob, is really, I I can see why it's so hard for business owners, because what what you're describing is what they don't want to contemplate is their business without them, right? When you'd get the, uh, we'll call it the owner fluff out of the financial statements, the, you know, the cards or whatever that don't belong there. Uh, When you talk about what a business looks like without the business owner being there and without their sales and management uh, expertise, what have you, what you're doing is really, uh, (laughs) it's hard for a a owner to contemplate, right? Because uh, they they don't want to think about themselves out of the business necessarily. You nailed it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about someone that has committed 70, 80 hours plus a week of their lives for how many years, who knows, uh, made tens of thousands of individual decisions. And, And there's some scientific evidence on this, by the way, a little drop of dopamine, I think hits somewhere in the brain that says, you are the king, you are the man, you are the woman, you made this happen. Um, and we're asking them to break that cycle. We're asking them to move on. We're asking them to separate themselves from this thing that is very much a part of themselves. Mm. <clears throat> if an owner um, gives us two to three, hopefully you know, four or five years, we can, we can help transition a lot of what the owner knows and, and, and disseminate that among other employees. Uh, we, we can we can structuralize some things. I don't know if that's a word. We can uh, systematize some things. We can we can create a business that answers that number one concern that buyers have deal after deal. Again, what happens to the business if something happens to the seller? So, yeah, um, it, it's a difficult challenge. And, and look, I'm, I'm a fourth generation entrepreneur. I get uh, I can even see it. In some of my kids, I get this notion of, you know, being in command and, you know, charting your own course and, and determining your own future. And then we're asking owners to stop all that at some point. So a lot of them have challenges with that, but uh, it, it can be made easier than, uh, than it would if, if preparation were, were done. Yeah. I wanted to get to that. So um, for those business owners listening to this and thinking, okay, Bob, I, you know, I'll take the medicine <laughs> Uh, help me get there. Uh, you know, what do you work with those kind of business owners that, that are, have the foresight come into you, you know, five, seven years ahead of time and say, Hey, I, I know, I understand I'm going to have to get out of this business at some point. Um, uh, help me. What do I need to do? Yeah. Uh, another great question, John, that is, um, that is an ideal scenario, actually. You wouldn't think somebody who, you know, makes their living off of, of uh, helping owners transition would say something like that. But uh, given enough time, yeah, let, let's try to close that value gap. Let's try to do the best we can for the owner or, or the people who depend on, on him or her. You know, whether it's building a legacy or providing for future generations or continuing the, the brand name and, the, and the, you know, the, the, the uh, the, the way that the business operates in the marketplace, continue that, that going forward. Um, if we have time, if, if the owner has capital, uh, if the owner has the right people, you know, other resources, let's try to close that value gap. Those are ideal situations um, for someone like me, because that means going to market and it means a quick, uh, a quick turn for the owner mm. for, who, who then becomes the seller. So we get involved early in terms of of getting back to the previous question you had about valuation. We get involved to to set those, to level set those expectations. What does true transferable value actually look like? What does that range of offers look like that we might get if we go to market? Let's compare that against the owner's expectations. If that's not enough, because you got to back out taxes, you got to back out 
you know, various professional fees. Um, if that net net is not enough, then then uh, and the owner has time, then that's actually a great situation because then you can work on on systematizing things. Then you can work on you know building processes and procedures in the business. And, and we work with uh, folks like David Shabson that you had on the show mm-hmm. uh, several months ago that uh, that can work with clients you know on a on a uh, short to intermediate term basis to help help solidify that value and help improve that value. Yeah, and and. Back to the value business valuation issue. I mean, these things change over time. I mean, so there's the objective part of this is trying to improve your own business, but then apply what you've done to how the markets are changing in terms of the way they, the way they value your business, right? Cause the, something's only worth what somebody is willing to pay for it at the end of the day. Right. That's right. That converse, that initial conversation of value, Again, every time I say these statistics, it it, it shocks me. But ninety eight percent of owners don't know the value of what they have, mm. and yet if this if the ownership of this business is the last thing they do before retirement, seventy six percent of them are counting on the sale of that business. Net of taxes and fees, seventy six percent are counting on the sale to have a successful retirement. Massive disconnect. So three out of four counting on the sale. 98% don't know the value of it. So we have that value conversation as early as possible. And it's level setting expectations. And it's letting them know if we go to market, what, what do the range of offers look like under today's conditions using market comparables, that, uh, which is basically uh, the, the data that exists out there for closed transactions. If the number is not the right number, the owner has time, money, people, and other resources. Let's try to close that gap. We can reassess value as often as we can load in new financial data, as often as we can load in new subjective data, and as often as those new comparable company transactions come out. So the owner, we, we're starting to see owners that want that business valuation uh, assessment done on an annual basis. So we had the, the initial conversation a long time ago. They were They were shocked. They were one of those three out of four that, you know, we gave them a, a lower number than they were expecting, but they, they wanted to drive towards some higher value. That's great. And with COVID and pandemic situation, you really have a significant opportunity to do that. Because again, transactions aren't, they're, they're for the most part not being done anyway. So spend the time to, to uh, improve your business value, invest your resources primarily to improve business value. And you'll see the result down the road. You'll see the result in, you know, a higher business value, yes, but standing out among your peers when you do go to market. Because buyers have options, and, and a lot of sellers forget this. Buyers can choose to buy a business, not buy a business, take their time, work the price down. They've got lots of options. Buyers are in control right now, which is vastly different than it used to be just seven or eight months ago when, when more sellers were in control. Mm-hmm. We'd like to see that balance tip back into sellers' favor, but it, it's going to be quite a while. And that valuation that you're describing that gets done, let's say once a year, really kind of acts as a uh, management report card in a way. It's something that the business owner can manage too, uh, dynamically uh, to their to their long term benefit. That's right. Uh, in a report like ours, we're not just delivering four different types of value: liquidation, asset, enterprise, and entity values. Uh, we're also delivering a whole slew of, of uh, KPIs, key performance indicators that the owner can take back to his or her management team, or if it's just them, they can look at. These are things which drive value. You know, you're, you're a lot of standard financial ratios, yes, but a lot of others that uh, that owners and, and maybe not even bankers think about often do tend to drive value. Is the buyer thinking about these KPIs? Maybe, maybe not, but improving your KPIs relative to your peers do increase value for sure. I would also say too, that um, unlike publicly traded stocks, which as long as the markets are open, the price is constantly being assessed. You can watch the stock tick up or tick down with red or green colors. That's great. Lots of new information being processed by the market, lots of new pricing going on. 
that doesn't happen in private ownership. And so as often as, as we can do these business valuations, it's like having, you know, your business looked at from a buyer standpoint uh, again and again. So it's, it's a pretty valuable service to, to do this valuation on an annual updated basis. Sure. It sounds like a great investment, folks. As we uh, speak with Bob Tanksley, and Bob is the, uh, he's, he's a principal with Neary Capital Partners. Bob, would lo- I'd love it. Maybe you don't necessarily need to mention names if that's not appropriate, but would love it if you would uh, maybe describe a success story that you're particularly proud of that illustrates the good work you do. Sure. Um, there was one situation. This was this is actually last year, uh, April. So before uh, before COVID, uh, we had a, a great success story. It was uh, Dad owned the company. He was ninety, I think ninety two. Oh wow! <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's a record, uh, at least in my book. Um, wow. Some of the some of the children. When I say children, you know, realize that these these children were in their mid sixties. Sure. Uh, were uh, active in the business. So uh, here we had, you know, multi-generational business, but dad was getting older and, uh, you know, he, he wasn't buying green bananas anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one. That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he was getting up in age, you know, time was taking the toll on him, but uh, he, he loved the work. It just came to a point where he just, he couldn't do this, uh, this kind of work physically anymore. Uh, the adult children had other interests. They were kind of helping dad out uh, with this business more on a part-time basis. And so uh, we, we found uh, we found the perfect buyer, uh, someone that uh, didn't have direct industry experience, but had a relative who had industry experience uh, that, that came in. And this buyer had a deep, deep, uh, a deep corporate background that lent itself real well uh, to this uh, this distribution based business model. That was a neat one uh, to work on. Mm. Um, I don't know if you're going to ask me about uh, things that, that went wrong, but, but I've got plenty of those stories too. Um, <laughs> well, we, so. the, I, I get the sense that, 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 that happens a lot of times based on owner expectations that really aren't what they should be based on where the market is. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so back to your question or, or your, your point earlier about, mm-hmm. you know, don't call my baby ugly. Uh, <laughs> owners invest uh, so many years, maybe even decades of blood, sweat, tears, and effort and time and untold amounts of money uh, poured into a business. Hopefully they got a lot of that back out and then some, but um, the, the owner that uh, often owners think that buyers recognize that and, and further are willing to pay for that. And they're just not. So uh, deals often fall apart on terms. We just, first and foremost, we can't agree on on the pricing. We're too far apart on the pricing. <clears throat> uh, you know, the owner doesn't see glaring problems that the buyer might legitimately have a concern about, mm-hmm. like too much owner uh, dependence. We often see that. So, it, yeah, it, it happens. It's out there. That's why we want these conversations to happen as soon as possible. Well, and what, uh, I mean, I'm sure some folks think, uh, you know, John's smart aleck by talking about ugly babies, but really what, what you're seriously, what you're trying to do is help folks. And I, I appreciate you bringing up this point. I mean, they put their blood, sweat and tears into a business and what you're helping them do is to make something out of all that effort as much as possible as can be made out of that effort and, and apply that activity productively to the value of the business. As, as early as possible, as often as possible. And sometimes we have to say it uh, a lot more than once, but once the owner realizes what drives value, what the drivers of value are in their particular company, it's magic. I have never delivered one of these valuation reports and it's, it's around a hundred plus of these that I've done where the owner didn't start making different and better decisions from that point forward. Once they understand what drives value, you, you, you see the light bulb go off. You see them start making uh, different and better decisions from that point forward and how they spend their time, how they spend their money on the people they hire, 
on the, uh, the, 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 the systematizing and the structuring of their business and developing of processes and documentation of processes. Uh, many, many of them, especially now, that want to retool, that want to recover, that want to uh, reinvent, are very open to this, this notion of, of doing things better than they have before. And yeah, it might mean paying a little higher tax. I know that comment may sound like it's coming out of nowhere, but usually these, these choices that we ask them to make, these decisions that, that drive business value, aren't necessarily the best thing for immediate income tax purposes. So we're asking them to maybe spend some money in a different area that, you know, that might not result in an immediate tax deduction. That's fine. But if the goal is driving value up, if the goal is making your company more, uh, more of a premium offering when it's time to go to market than other companies that will be going to market at that time, it might be worth it. It's for that owner to decide if it's worth it. But, you know, if, if, um, if there's, if we can have, you know, just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of sacrifice in the front end, it, it can pay enormous dividends in the future. You know, I have to say as an aside, um, Bob, I mean, you've, you're, uh, uh, as you say, a come from a family of entrepreneurs, you're an MBA, you're CPA somewhere in there. It's got to be psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think I should have gotten a, a psychology <laughs> undergrad instead of accounting. Right. Um, maybe I need to go back to school, but, <laughs> but uh, I guess being a fourth generation entrepreneur, I've, I've, uh, I've kind of got that part figured out. I'm, I'm in the owner's mind already before I even meet him or her. Sure. You're right. There, there definitely is a, uh, a psychological component to it. Um, again, we're asking somebody who's probably put, 20, 25, 30 plus years into something uh, to transition out of it. And that may not always be a sale. I get that. Mm. I'm absolutely fine with that. If the right thing for the client to do is, uh, uh, is to not have a third party buy their business, but do some type of internal uh, transition, some type of internal buyout, <clears throat> maybe through a employee stock option plan and ESOP plan, then, you know, that might be their better option, but it's, it's, it's what matters it's what's for the family that matters. It's what's for that owner's legacy that matters to me. Uh, well, Bob, you know, I was going to ask what a business owner that's thinking about selling sometime way in the future ought to do. And I think we've already gotten the answer to that question, which is get in touch with you about, uh, you know, getting, evaluation and getting a, a report card on what their business would look like in a sale. So let's get straight to how folks can be in touch with you and uh, learn more about that. Learn more about you and your uh, practice generally. Sure. Um, probably the best way is uh, a phone call. Love to talk to people. Love it. Uh, so that phone number is 770-633-633. 1083 770-633-1083. That's my cell number. Like most Americans, I have it with me 23 hours a day. Uh, email address is uh, B, the letter B, followed by my last name spelled as T-A-N-K-E-S-L-E-Y at nearycap.com. That's N as Nancy, E-R-I-C-A-P.com. So B Tankusley at nearycap.com. And that's our website, of course, to nearycap.com. Awesome. Bob Tanksley from Neary Capital. Neary Capital Partners, I should say. It's been a pleasure, Bob. Thanks so much for being with us. John, thanks again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Folks, uh, just a quick um, shout out to S.E. Escobedo over at Office Angels. So if you've got some help, uh, need some help that involves uh, maybe you got to get your books straightened out so bob can look at your financials <laughs> maybe you've got some administrative tasks you need to outsource uh, so that uh, you can work on your business not in your business well the lady that can help you is se escobedo over at office angels she's got a whole team of angels that will um, fly in get the work done and fly back out they've been virtual for 18 years now as long as they've been um, 
in existence, and so they know how to operate in this environment. Uh, give SE a call, 770-442-9246. Uh, she's terrific, and uh, she'll be uh, honored to help you, I know. Um, and I know her personally, so she's uh, terrific. Uh, folks, just another quick uh, reminder for, as we close, uh, you can find our show on all the major podcast apps. I won't mention all of them, but we're on all of them. So North Fulton Business Radio is the search term. You can find us uh, on your favorite app. We would love it, love it if you give us a great review because if you do that, it helps people find the show and folks that are looking for help from great business leaders like Bob uh, helps their, those shows to be found. So we'd appreciate that. And you can also connect with us on social media, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. North Fulton BRX is our handle. So for my guest, Bob Tanksley, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton Business Radio.